Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India The cell membrane is composed of proteins, lipids and carbohydrates. Today's lecture focuses on cell membrane lipids. We have learnt that the lipids of the cell membrane are arranged as a bilayer. Each of these in the cartoon represents a molecule of lipid. The blue bubble here represents the hydrophilic region of the lipid and the yellow tails represent the hydrophobic region of the molecule. Since the cell membrane separates extra and intracellular fluids, these hydrophilic ends have to dissolve in those fluids and the hydrophobic tails have to turn away from the fluids and dissolve in each other. So, such a bilayer arrangement is probably the only possible arrangement for the cell membrane. What is the thickness of the cell membrane or rather how thin is it? To compare it with an everyday analogy, let us take a soap bubble. The film of the soap bubble, they say, should have a thickness of at least the wavelength of visible light that is 400 to 700 nanometers because it reflects visible light. In comparison, the cell membrane is one hundredth the thickness of the film of a soap bubble that is 4 to 10 nanometers or 40 to 100 angstrom units that is the thickness of the bilayer membrane. The cell membrane also functions as an electrical capacitor because the lipids of the membrane form an insulating layer separating two electrolytes on either sides. So, the layer of extracellular and intracellular fluids alongside the membrane can be thought of as parallel plates of this capacitor, the lipid itself being the insulating material in between. And it is a charged capacitor at that because if you put an electrode inside the cell and keep a reference electrode outside and measure the voltage across, it comes to about 80 millivolts. Minus 80 millivolts because the negativity is, is on the inside and the active electrode is placed within the cell. Now, this is a huge voltage. To understand the enormity of the field that the membrane exists in, let us calculate the field. That is, the voltage per centimeter if we extrapolate. For example, this AA sized battery here is a 1.5 volt battery and the distance across the two ends is 4 centimeters. That gives us a field of about 0.4 volts per centimeter. In comparison, the field that the cell membrane is subjected to is 80,000 volts per centimeter. Now, this is a huge voltage and if the membrane can exist without breaking down in this huge electrical field, then the dielectric constant of the membrane must be very high or the lipids of the cell membrane are such good insulators and it is these lipids that we are going to learn about just now. The lipids of the cell membrane can be classified into phospholipids, sphingolipids, glycolipids and cholesterol. We will look at the phospholipids first. It's better to refer to them as glycerophospholipids because they have a glycerol backbone and they have to be differentiated from the sphingophospholipids. So, the glycerophospholipids have four components making them up. Three are shown here and we will come to the fourth a little later. The first three components are glycerol, two fatty acids and a phosphate moiety which would combine to form what is called a phosphatidic acid molecule. 
Now, this is a list of fatty acids and any of these can go into these two slots of fatty acids shown here. Here we have the essential fatty acids which are those that the body cannot synthesize and we depend on our diet for those. Partially essential fatty acids can be synthesized by the body to a certain extent but we rely largely on our diet to obtain these. In fact, 90 percent of the phospholipids in the brain are partially essential fatty acids and fish oils are a rich source of partially essential fatty acids. Now, how do these three combine? Before that, we can see how a triglyceride molecule is made up because triglycerides are molecules that we know about better because that is a popular concept of a fat. In a triglyceride, three fatty acids form ester linkages with the three hydroxyls of the glycerol molecule. That is a triglyceride molecule. Now, in, a, in phosphatidic acid, the glycerol molecule, I have flipped one of the hydroxyls for convenience. The two fatty acids form ester linkages with two hydroxyls of the glycerol and the phosphate moiety combines with the other hydroxyl group of the glycerol. Now, this is what we call phosphatidic acid. Phosphatidic acid in turn combines with any one of these four polar compounds shown here, choline, ethanolamine, serine or inositol to form a phospholipid. So, we have phosphatidylcholine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylserine and phosphatidyl inositol. These are the four glycerophospholipids which make up the cell membrane. They form the predominant phospholipids forming the cell membrane. Now, this was a cartoon we saw earlier when we looked at the bilayer membrane where there was a blue bubble and the tails. Now, we know that this blue bubble or the hydrophilic end is formed by glycerol and the phosphoserine or phosphoethanolamine moiety. That is the hydrophilic region which dissolves in the fluids inside and outside and the fatty acids make up the hydrophobic region which dissolves in each other. Now, we have names for the molecules that we found on the cell membrane. What we have to understand next is that there is a certain polarity to the location of these phospholipids on the cell membrane. Not all of them are found in both leaflets. Phosphatidylcholine is the only phospholipid found on the outer leaflet and the other three are found only on the inner leaflet. This orientation seems to be important and in fact there are enzymes called ATP dependent enzymes called flippases and floppases which work to maintain this polarity. For example, if phosphatidylcholine moves to the inner leaflet for some reason, flippases will push them back against a concentration gradient to the outer leaflet and floppases help to maintain the concentrations of the other three in the internal leaflet only. In uh, the fluid mo mosaic model of Singer and Nicholson, we have learnt that the lipids of lateral mobility, the lipids making up the cell membrane can move laterally in this fluid. But now we have to understand that the lateral mobility is restricted to that conditional leaflet. Phosphatidylcholine can move only along the outer leaflet and the other three can move only along the inner leaflet. There are other enzymes called scramblases which would scramble this polarity and allow these phospholipids to move to either leaflet. Scramblases are activated when a cell undergoes apoptosis. Apoptosis is the mechanism of programmed cell death. That is, every normal cell is programmed to die after a while. And when this happens, scramblases are also activated and 
phospholipids, which are normally found on the inner leaflet, move to the outer leaflet. In fact, finding phosphatidyl serine on the outer leaflet is an eat me signal for macrophages. Macrophages would then come and phagocytose that cell and remove it from the system. In fact, cancer cells do not have this apoptotic mechanism and that's why they proliferate indefinitely. Among these four phospholipids that we've just seen, keep in mind phosphatidyl inositol. We will come back to that a little later. We will now move on to the sphingolipids in the cell membrane. The backbone to which fatty acids were attached in a glycer glycerophospholipid was glycerol, whereas in a sphingophospholipid, this backbone is made up of sphingosin or dihydrosphingosin bases. Just this much, without any other side chain, sphingosin with the two fatty acids is called a ceramide. Ceramides are waxy substances. They make up the vernix caseosa. I learned this from Wikipedia. Uh, the vernix that coats a newborn when it is just delivered is made up of ceramides. The ceramides can also take on these phosphocyte chains, phosphocholine, phosphoethanolamine, phosphoserine or phosphoinositol, and then they form sphingophospholipids. These two sphingophospholipids are specifically referred to as sphingomyelin and sphingomyelin is found on the outer leaflet of the cell membrane as well. They are not found on the inner leaflet. We will come back to sphingomyelin a little later and now we will move on to glycolipids. Glycolipids is not a special entity different from what we have considered just now. In fact, the lipids on the outer leaflet of the cell membrane, phosphatidylcholine and sphingomyelin, some of them have carbohydrate side chains attached to them and now we refer to them as glycolipids, either glycophospholipids or glycosphingolipids. Now, not only the lipids in the outer leaflet, but also the cell membrane proteins can have this glycoside chain. And we refer to the glycoside chains of glycolipids and glycoproteins together as a glycocalyx. We know about the glycocalyx of the bacterial cells better. Here is a bacterial cell and that fuzzy layer around is the glycocalyx. This is a transition, transmission electron micrograph. A glycocalyx of a bacterial cell helps it in many ways. It helps its virulence in many ways. For example, it may make the cell bigger and make it more difficult for that cell to be phagocytosed. It may hide the proteins on the bacterial membrane which would which would elicit an immune attack. Those proteins can be kept hidden by the glycocalyx. There are many uses for this glycocalyx on the bacteria. And in fact, when you have left water in a bucket for a long time, you pour the water out and you feel the insides of the bucket. It would be slimy. That sliminess is due to the bacterial film that is formed. And that sliminess is specifically due to the glycocalyx of the bacteria. If this glycocalyx is arranged in a very compact manner, that in fact forms the capsule of a bacterial cell, which enhances its virulence. The role of the glycocalyx in eukaryotic cell, we are just beginning to understand. It probably is important for the cell identity, for a cell to recognize, for, for a cell to be recognized as a self-antigen. Let us now move on to cholesterol in the cell membrane. Cholesterol is also an amphipathic molecule. It has a hydroxyl group which is, is in the region of the hydrophilic heads of the other phospholipids. 
Cholesterol is also found only on the outer leaflet like sphingomyelin. Both cholesterol and sphingomyelin are not found homogeneously distributed all along the outer leaflet of the cell membrane. They are enriched in certain special regions and these regions of the membrane which are enriched in cholesterol and sphingomyelin are referred to as lipid rafts. Lipid rafts are defined as membrane microdomains enriched in cholesterol, sphingomyelin and some proteins. Now while the rest of the lipids in the cell membrane have lateral mobility that is the outer leaflet phospholipids and the inner leaflet phospholipids can move independently of each other. In a lipid raft mobility is restricted first of all and even if the molecules had to move they would move as a whole both the outer and inner leaflets would move as a whole. So they are more rigid parts of the cell membrane and a lot of research is happening in the area of lipid rafts now. Two of the popular roles ascribed to lipid rafts we shall see now. One is that the region of the lipid rafts may serve to co-localize proteins and why so? For example, if there is a hormone acting on a cell, it would bind to a membrane receptor and that would activate another membrane protein and that would activate another protein, so on and so forth. So serial activation of these proteins would be favored if those proteins occurred next to each other and one possible role of lipid rafts is that they would help to co-localize such proteins. And the other role is that these are regions where endocytosis can occur. At school you would have learnt about endocytosis and you would have learnt that a protein called clathrin present on the inside of the cell membrane helps in endocytosis. We call that clathrin mediated endocytosis where the cell membrane would form invaginations called clathrin coated pits and then they would eventually form endocytotic vesicles which pinch off. Lipid rafts offer another mode of endocytosis. We can refer to them as clathrin independent endocytosis. Now this clathrin independent endocytosis has become a serious topic for research now because this mechanism seems to be the one by which certain pathogens gain entry into the cell like HIV, Salmonella or malarial pathogen. They seem to get into a cell through clathrin independent endocytosis mediated through lipid rafts. Professor Satyajit Mayer at the National Center for Biological Sciences Bengaluru is a pioneer, pioneering researcher in the field of lipid rafts. There are a set of YouTube lectures by him and if you want to learn more about lipid rafts you could watch those videos. When we considered the phospholipids of the cell membrane, a special mention was made about phosphatidyl inositol. We will now see details about phosphatidyl inositol. And this is a cartoon of the phosphatidyl inositol molecule. That's the phosphatidic acid and that's the inositol. Now in the membrane, you not only find phosphatidyl inositol, but also phosphates of phosphatidyl inositol. Now this inositol can take up one, two or three phosphates to make up phosphatidyl inositol monophosphate, phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate or phosphatidyl inositol triphosphate. This group of compounds uh, is called phosphoinositides. Phosphoinositides can be acted upon by some enzymes also found in the cell membrane. These enzymes are called phospholipases. There are two important phospholipases, phospholipase C and phospholipase A2. Phospholipase C would act at this point. Now here is phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate 
and phospholipase C cleaves the molecule here so that we get a diacyl glycerol molecule and an inositol triphosphate. Both diacyl glycerol and inositol triphosphate are important signaling molecules. Inositol triphosphate can open calcium channels on the endoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. We will learn more about that later on. The other enzyme which can act on phosphatidyl inositol bisphosphate or other phosphoinositides is phospholipase A2. It can specifically cleave off arachidonic acid from the phosphoinositides. And arachidonic acid is an important signaling molecule too because arachidonic acid released from the membrane can be processed within the cytoplasm to form a set of powerful compounds called prostaglandins. Arachidonic acid can be acted upon by either the cyclooxygenase enzyme to form prostaglandin G, which goes on to form the other known prostaglandins, or it can be acted upon by lipooxygenase to form leukotrienes. Prostaglandins have many important roles in the body. For example, they are important for forming the mucus coat of the gastric mucosa, which protects the gastric mucosa from the acids in the stomach. They are important in establishing labor at the end of pregnancy. And they also mediate inflammation. When there is an injury to the body, there are inflammatory processes, which is redness, swelling, recruiting other white cells to the region of injury, etc., etc. These inflammatory processes are mediated by some prostaglandins as well as by leukotrienes. They are important for platelet aggregation as well. A set of compounds called NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they help to reduce inflammation by inhibiting the cyclooxygenase enzyme. If we had non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we should understand that steroids are also anti-inflammatory. Corticosteroids, either endogenous or those that are given therapeutically, help to reduce inflammation by acting, by inhibiting the phospholipase A2 enzyme, which would release arachidonic acid from the membrane phospholipids. It's time to summarize now. We've considered the lipids of the cell membrane. They are listed here. And we've seen polarity of these lipids on the cell membrane and when that polarity would be disturbed and what happens after that. We've also considered lipid rafts. From here, we should move on to a discussion on cell membrane proteins. Thank you for choosing to watch this NPTEL lecture.